All right, so today we're going to talk about non-invasive testing for PAD or peripheral arterial disease. It's something that's actually very important if you're going to really build a robust vascular practice uh, when you're on the job or when you're out in the community. Uh, it's something that actually was uh, started a long time ago by radiologists, and uh, a lot of it now has been is done by really a lot of different specialties. So it can be interventional radiology, interventional cardiology, and vascular surgery. And so a lot of these practices will have robust non-invasive uh, labs or, or testing available. And this really takes the full, it really encompasses the full spectrum from arterial all the way to venous disease, whether it's superficial or deep venous, uh, et cetera. And it can also encompass uh, carotids, transcranial Doppler, and abdominal aortic aneurysms and mesenteric disease, renal disease, et cetera. Uh, you could even throw in tips uh, into that category as well. And so the main thing to look at today is we're gonna focus really on peripheral arterial disease and non-invasive testing for that. So just to give everybody a reminder, remember there's several PAD uh, uh, pathways in terms of how patients present. Remember the majority of patients are still asymptomatic. They have some level of peripheral arterial disease but they're not really manifesting symptoms yet. And really a lot of people like to think of, well, everything is either claudication or a wound. And in reality, you know, a third of patients uh, really present with atypical leg pain where you're trying to figure out what is going on and where the level of disease is. 15% classic claudication, they walk a certain distance, they have uh, discomfort in a certain part of the leg. It improves after five to 10 minutes of, of, of rest. They walk the same distance, so it's reproducible, and it also uh, is relieved by the same time interval of, of rest whenever possible. And then obviously CLI is a big thing that's on the landscape today and across the world because of the increase in uh, diabetes and CKD. But that's really, if you think about it, it's really one to 2%, but that's still millions and millions of people that are being affected. And then there's ALI, one to 2%. So remember, when we're talking about uh, outpatient PAD, we're talking about the categories related to that and not acute limb ischemia, which is a separate uh, discussion and a separate uh, Rutherford classification. So this one uh, is the classification system you're gonna use for the standard outpatient PAD um, uh, who, uh, patient who presents to your office. So obviously, you know, if they're asymptomatic, well, then they're obviously Rutherford zero and you're probably not gonna see those patients anyway. Uh, one, two, and three is uh, differing degrees of claudication. And then when you get to Rutherford class four, five, and six, that is CLI or critical limb ischemia or chronic limb threatening ischemia, depending on uh, which guidelines you're reading. And that's the classic uh, CLI or CLTI that a lot of people talk about. And remember, there are um, objective hemodynamic parameters you can use to determine which category they fit in. In terms of symptom history, remember when you're talking to these patients in, the, in your workup and you're getting a history, uh, if they have buttock and hip pain, you're classically thinking of aortoiliac disease or inflow disease. If they have thigh pain, either they've got uh, inflow disease or they've got common femoral artery disease or a combination of deep femoral and proximal SFA. Uh, if they have calf, you're thinking of SFA or fem and, and popliteal artery, so fem pop disease. And if they have foot claudication, which I've seen a few patients of this where they walk and they basically have pain, discomfort, and numbness in the foot, uh, that is classically below knee disease. And obviously you have to differentiate that from arthritis and, and other issues that they could have uh, in terms of uh, abnormalities related to their Achilles tendon and their and, and plantar fasciitis. So when you're talking about the vascular lab laboratory, uh, specifically geared towards patients for PAD, uh, these are the really the things that are being done. So pulse volume recording, segmental pressures, ABI, TBI, toe PPGs, and duplex ultrasound. I did not include TCPO2 and, and, or, or TCOM on here, which is used to really check for the oxygenation or the oxygen tension within this, the tissues. Uh, of the foot, particularly around a wound, because that's that's a separate talk that I think really deserves a lot of, uh, it's a very involved talk, and I thought it'd be better to give you an overview of the most common things. Remember, when you have patients that come in and you say, I want a non-invasive lower extremity arterial study, you're really talking about the first, four th first three things, PVRs, segmental pressures, and ABI. 
any patient with diabetes and CKD, you have to add a TBI. And the reason for that is because in patients who have diabetes and CKD, they tend to have heavy, heavy calcification, be it medial and intimal. And the uh, problem with that is that the ABI will be artificially elevated because the blood, the arteries or the blood vessels are so non-compliant. It is very difficult for the blood pressure cups to squeeze the vessels to get an accurate measurement. And so you may get a diabetic or a patient with CKD who's got really profound symptoms and your ABI will be, uh, you know, 0.9. And you'll be like, well, your disease isn't that bad. But in reality, their disease is a lot worse than you think. The reason for the toe brachial index in these patients is because the arteries below the ankle tend to be affected much less um, in terms of this medial calcinosis or calcification involving the arteries uh, in these patients. And so the TBI tends to be a much more accurate result. Toe PPGs we'll go over, and then obviously I'll throw in duplex ultrasound. So, you know, when you're ordering a test, you have to specify, I want PBR, segmental pressures, ABI, and or TBI. And if you want toe PPGs in somebody who has toe ulcers, toe pain, uh, blue toe syndrome, et cetera, you have to add, I'd like also add toe PPGs. The duplex arterial ultrasound is a separate study uh, that can also get done. So in terms of your armamentarium of, of an office practice, you can do these, throw in duplex arterial ultrasound plus your history and vascular exam in terms of a pulse exam. And you'll have a lot of information in terms of the level of the disease and what your approach and what, what you uh, have to deal with. So remember, these are some important points here. So remember, proximal to distal that you know segmental pressure is greater than 20 or a decrease in the segmental brachial index greater than 0.15 indicates occlusive disease and correlates with the level of stenosis i'll show you what that means if you have a dif difference in segmental pressures from right to left or left to right of 30 or more you have to consider that's that side that has the decrease as abnormal a tbi less than 0.7 is uh considered abnormal in every patient and absolute toe pressure is something to look at, especially in the setting of wounds, because if it's greater than 30, that means that you're more, most more likely to get some level of wound healing. But in diabetics, because of their, um, my, because their microcirculation is affected more profoundly, you typically would want a toe pressure that's higher. So this is something that'll make sense as we go on in the talk. So when you're, when you know, all these PVR studies that we order, when we say, oh, order a PVR, it encompasses three things. So this is how it's done, multiple blood pressure cups, inflated at different times, and it gives you pulse volume recordings, which is a graphical representation of the blood flow changes throughout the leg. It gives you segmental pressures, so pressures uh, at different points in the leg. It gives you, and then, and then obviously they calculate an ABI as well, and then we throw in a TBI if they have diabetes or CKD. And so what is a PVR? Like I said, it's a graphical representation of blood volume changes in the legs. And so when you're looking at PVRs, I want you to look at this chart here the first one on the top left is really a Doppler ultrasound signal. So that is a classic normal triphasic waveform. Those are the, um, it's annotated in terms of what each peak represents. And to the right of it is actually a pulse volume recording. So you can see they're very different in appearance. And so you don't wanna get the two confused. The left is a Doppler ultrasound waveform, which we, will do traditionally in all, on arterial and venous studies as, as we've all seen. And on the one on the top right, that's a normal pulse volume recording. And so when you look at the one on the bottom, that is another pulse volume recording, but abnormal. And so what you're looking for when they talk about normal terminologies, I want you to look at that top right, sharp systolic upstroke, very little rounding of the peak. It says a sharp peak, you have a dichrotic notch, and then you have a little concavity there. Um, in that uh, forward diastolic flow phase. And so when you look down below, now you see that's an abnormal pulse volume recording where you've got, you, you don't have a rapid upstroke. So delayed upstroke, rounding of the peak, loss of the dichrotic notch, and uh, the rest of it is, is a little bit more flat uh, as you're in the uh, diastolic, uh, forward diastolic flow phase. So that's, that's, that's Doppler ultrasound versus PVR. So I want you to look now, these are PVRs. And I want you to look what happens when you have a stenosis. Pretty obvious, I think, right? You're at, you lose amplitude, you have uh, your rapid upstroke is gone, you have rounding of the peak, you've lost the dichrotic notch. So you know there's a, some level of disease, be it a stenosis or occlusion, through there. Remember, this is a functional test to give you kind of the volume of blood flow that's occurring. 
So as a result, look what happens as collaterals develop. You can see the difference now that now this waveform is starting to look more normalized. And you can see a lot of times the pressure may be normalized as well. And you can see here, this is a patient with really pretty diffuse SFA and popliteal artery disease. Remember the SFA becomes the popliteal artery angiographically when you see the descending geniculate artery. A lot of people will use the medial border of the femur as the kind of the transition where the adductor canal starts. So two different ways to look at it. Anatomically though, it's where the descending geniculate artery comes off. But you have to understand that this is a functional test of with, it's really talking about physiologic flow. And you wanna make sure that you're not getting fooled as in this case, you can see the collaterals have really normalized uh, the PBR. So toe PPGs are where they use really an infrared PPG sensor to detect blood flow and it converts flow in a digital artery to a waveform. So this is when we're looking at patients with blue toes, cool toes, ischemic toes, um, and ulcers on the toes. They might do two toe PPGs to see, is there any flow in the digital artery? So you can see on the left, you have a CLI patient with very little flow below the ankle. There's no pedal loop. There's no really no digital arteries. After revascularization, you can see that there's a significant improvement in blood flow. And then you can look at the corresponding toe PPGs. On the left, completely flat. On the right, after revascularization, you have at least some flow now in those toes, which can really help heal a wound, a small ulcer, et cetera, uh, in this patient. Remember when you're talking about duplex arterial ultrasound, a lot of people forget the nuance of this. Duplex arterial ultrasound includes two things, B-mode imaging, where you're actually getting a ultrasound image of the vessel that you're looking at, plus a Doppler waveform. So when you're thinking of duplex arterial ultrasound, whether it's in the office, when you're looking at it yourself, or when you're taking a board exam, et cetera, remember it encompasses two separate things and you need to be very precise and clear in your um, discussion or uh, your assessment to make sure that you understand the nuances of each. This is the difference. So now this is very different from PBRs, right? Now you're looking at triphasic, biphasic, and monophasic. So as you lose that peak below the uh, baseline, now you can see how it transitions. And sometimes it's very difficult to tell. And so a lot of page people will dictate I see it's monophasic to biphasic, it's, tri it's biphasic to triphasic, if it's in kind of that in-between phase, just to indicate that there's some level, there's some abnormality there, but it's not clearly fitting into a box. So it's not as precise as this graph shows, sometimes, this, these, this diagram shows, but just understand that this is Doppler waveforms. In the top right, those are pulse volume recordings, very different things. They're obtained differently and they actually give you different information. So think of PVRs in some way as physiologic flow. It's giving you blood volume. It's giving you a qualitative assessment of what is going on in the limb. Whereas with duplex arterial ultrasound, BMO imaging plus Doppler waveforms, you're getting a much more quantitative assessment of where the level of abnormality is. And you're getting in, in some cases, if you have a good ultrasound tech or a good ultrasound team, you're getting structural information of where the problem is or the level of abnormality. So obviously this is a duplex arterial ultrasound. It's a little blurry, I apologize. But uh, you can see on top, you've got your B mode imaging or grayscale imaging with color flow on. Below, you've got a normal triphasic waveform. So remember, this is duplex arterial ultrasound. Remember though, that when you obtain this Doppler waveform analysis, there's pitfalls. You can take a vessel that is completely normal and based on your angle of insonation, you can make it completely abnormal. And so you'll see a lot of these reports will say monophasic in the dorsalis pedis artery bilaterally on every patient, which is impossible, right? It just doesn't make sense. And part of that reason is because the technologist or the physician who did this study, whoever did it, was not using the proper angle of insulation. And so was getting this waveform on the right, which is a monophasic Doppler waveform. So you can see you got to be very careful. And this actually applies when you're using a handheld Doppler. So you'll notice a lot of times with a handheld Doppler, you're like, oh, the flow is not bad. Then you change your angle and it becomes much, it either normalizes or becomes completely abnormal. So you have to be very careful in your assessment. 
The other thing to think about is a pitfall with Doppler uh, uh, spectral analysis is that when patients have heavy, heavy uh, intimal or medial calcification, is that if the if you're not getting a good Doppler signal, it doesn't necessarily mean that the artery is occluded. If you look at this vessel here, if I insinated where there's no flow to the right of that blood vessel, see on the right part of the image, there's very little color flow there. That's because the calcification is preventing the Doppler signal from penetrating. And then if it can't penetrate, it can't really bounce back. So you end up getting nothing. You get almost no flow there. And then you get fooled thinking that, oh, the whole thing's occluded and there's a problem. What's going on? The best way to do it, turn on the color flow. Where you see color flow means the Doppler signal is making its way through and is being transmitted properly. That's where you put your Doppler gate. That's where you obtain your Doppler uh, uh, waveform. And here's another example of that same thing. If you look at this here, heavily calcified artery, again, where the color flow is, is where the signal is getting through best place to insinate or to put your Doppler gate to obtain your, your uh, waveform analysis. So let's look at some basic cases. So here's classic PVR on the left. You can see on the top, it says uh, segmental pressure and PVR study. Patients, what the baseline or the, the comparison in this case that the machine uses is the, the brachial artery pressure. So they obtain, as you can see, right and left brachial artery pressures. That's a systolic pressure. So if there's a difference of 10 or more from right arm to left arm, you have a central problem. Either a, uh, you have either a stenosis or occlusion proximal to the brachial artery. That's really all you can comment on if you have a difference of 10 or more. And so that tells you that, okay, well, there's something up there that I, I have to deal with. The next thing I want you to notice is that you see is that they put kind of these blue boxes at different levels. That's to show you where the blood pressure cuffs were. And in each box, you're getting basically the segmental pressure. So it's obtaining a systolic pressure uh, in e at each of those levels on both sides. So uh, if you have a difference of 30 from side to side, that's abnormal. If you have a difference from um, top to bottom or proximal to distal of 20 or more, that's abnormal. Uh, the next thing is I want you to look at the segmental brachial index. If you look, see how on the, right, on the top left uh, of the left leg, it says segmental pressure 105, and then it gives you a 0.86 value. Again, that can give you ideas of where the level of abnormality is as well. And then the classic on the lower, uh, below the feet, you can see is the ABI on the right is 1.06. The ABI on the left is 0 0.73. So if we look at this, so every PVR non-invasive, when people say I'm getting a non-invasive study, that's what they're talking about. They get the, all those things, PVR, segmental pressures, and ABIs. I'm just going to say it over and over so it, it kind of really sinks in. That is a classic non-invasive uh, non arterial study. On top of that, all labs that are at least accredited, and even if they're not, they should be also giving you a Doppler uh, waveform at the common femoral arteries. And so you'll get these things right here. And, and the reason for that is because a lot of times <coughs> when, a, when a technologist puts the blood pressure cuff in the high thigh and, or when they're getting a waveform up high, you don't know if they put that cuff very high up or lower, right? Sometimes patients have large panaces. They have a kind of their fat panaces hanging, the panace is hanging down. And so the cuff will go lower and lower because the tech thinks, oh, the inguinal ligament must be lower and lower. And then that artificially gives you abnormal values. And so a lot of times technologists will say, well, let me at least Doppler the CFA and, 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 and the on both sides. So if you look at this, the way I would look at this is I would dictate that the right brachial pressure is 122 mmHg, so millimeters of mercury. The left is 122. So there's no asymmetry there, so that's okay. I would say that uh, now I would look at, if you look at the pulse volume, or you could look at the Doppler waveform analysis, right? So if you look at the left CFA, I think you can see that there is a difference compared to the right CFA, right? You have a triphasic waveform above, you have a, a systolic peak, it comes down below the baseline, comes back up, and then you've got forward diastolic flow. If you look at the waveform below, it never goes below the baseline. You have a monophasic waveform. So just looking at that Doppler ultrasound uh, waveform in the left common femoral artery, I know that there's some level of disease from the aorta to the groin on the left side. That's inflow disease or aortoiliac disease. So that tells me right away, there's a problem on the left side. If we're looking just at the pulse volume recordings without those, 
you can see that the high thigh is complete on the left side. It's the top waveform up there is completely dampened, right? There's a, uh, there's a, the systolic upstroke is not, sh is not rapid. It's delayed. There's a delayed systolic upstroke. There's marked rounding of the peak and there's complete loss of the dichrotic, a dichrotic notch and you've lost amplitude. All the hallmark, hallmarks of a problem upstream from, from that left high thigh. So when I take that high thigh waveform and this, I know that there's definitely some level of aortoiliac disease or inflow disease on the left side. And you can even look at the, um, uh, you can look at the, uh, the ABI on the left side too. It's 0.7, right? So it's telling you there's at least one level of disease there. Now you might say, well, what about the above knee waveform and the below knee waveform? Those are abnormal as well when you compare them to the right side. Yeah, they are. But once you have inflow disease, those waveforms have to be significantly reduced. If you look, you can kind of see a dichrotic notch involving the left below knee uh, waveform and the left ankle waveform is is okay overall morphology. That's kind of a, an experience thing with time, but you know this is kind of classic iliac disease on the left side. So here's what this patient had. They basically this was a severe claudicate, so they were Rutherford uh, class three uh, lifestyle limiting claudication. You know he had all the typical risk factors and so forth, and so we recanalized his occluded left iliac system placed covered stents, and then we're able to achieve a nice angiographic result with filling of that left limb. And then you can imagine that with just improving of this, this, uh, uh, the CT, with re resolving this CTO, patient symptoms significantly improved. This is a case that I, I may have shown you already, but it, it really shows you what fempop disease look, looks like. Again, it's a relatively healthy woman with the exception of diabetes longstanding. She's otherwise very healthy, exercises and so forth. She had this on her toe and on top of it, she had palpable pulses. So now what do you think most docs will do? Most docs will say, oh, well, your pulses are palpable. Therefore, you don't have a problem. There's no issue here. That's where you get fooled. Remember, patients with peripheral arterial disease can have palpable pulses. They can be in relatively good shape you know, depending on what your metrics are for that. And they can have really profound disease. So this lady at first, I said, you know, this is probably nothing to worry about. I'm sure this will heal with, with proper podiatry and wound care, but let's order a non-invasive test to make sure. And so lo and behold, we did. And you can see here are the things encompassed in a, in a PVR test. On the top, right common femoral artery, left common femoral artery. That's the Doppler waveform. They're triphasic. So we know there's no aeroiliac or inflow disease. And then we have our standard segmental pressure and PBR study. The brachial pressures, 150 on the right, 157 on the left, they're within 10, within 20, normal. So there doesn't seem to be any problem in terms of a central arterial stenosis of any type. And then we've got some vessels. Now, if you look at that top right blue box at the high thigh, it says greater than 173. What that means is that because of her diabetes, She's got some level of calcification that's making the artery non-compliant. So we're not able to obtain an accurate measurement of the uh, peak systolic pressure there. So that's what that means. And so that means you're not gonna be able to use that value um, quantitatively. And you have to rely really on the PBRs. The beauty of the PBRs is they're not really affected by calcification and so forth. And so you can get accurate um, um, information uh, qualitatively from this. So if you look at this again, so if you look at the, let's focus on the left leg, that's a symptomatic with the great symptomatic leg with the great toe. So you can see here, left thigh, relatively normal PBR. It's got a nice sharp systolic upstroke. There's no very little or no rounding of the peak. Uh, and uh, the, you know, the dichrotic notch is not seen, but again, you know, th that's a very subtle thing that may disappear. And so you have to use all your information together. And so I knew also that she has a normal common from artery pulse for my vascular exam. So I know there's clearly no inflow disease, but when you look from thigh to calf, you should have augmentation or increased amplitude. And the reason is when you get down to the left calf area, the volume of blood from the 
common femoral SFA and the deep femoral artery is increased because of those two vessels. The SFA and the profunda kind of give you an increased blood volume by the time you get to the calf. So if you look at the right side, right thigh to right calf, you see how you have augmentation. So they'll say there's augmentation from thigh to calf. What they're saying is that the volume of blood has increased from thigh to calf, and that's what should happen. And the things that'll make that not happen is when you have disease either in the SFA and popliteal artery uh, or a combination or, or common femoral artery disease can also do it as well, right? Because you're preventing that blood flow from reaching there um, like it should. And so remember when I'm looking at this left thigh, left calf, hmm, there's no augmentation from thigh to calf. There's a problem in the fem pop segment. So the way I would dictate this is that I would say that common femoral artery waveforms are triphasic and normal. Uh, there's no evidence of aortoiliac inflow disease. There's lack of augmentation from left thigh to left calf. This is compatible with left femoral popliteal occlusive disease. Again, I'm saying that because it's very generic, but at the same time, we can't tell. Is it common femoral artery disease? Is it a combination of profunda and SFA disease? Or is it just SFA pop disease? We can't tell. We just know that the, the volume of blood reaching the calf is a lot lower than the right side. And so this is what I saw. And I was actually kind of surprised, to be honest with you, because she had palpable pulses in the foot, which I shouldn't be, right? Because I just told you you shouldn't be. But I just assumed that ah, she's in pretty good shape. She's well-controlled diabetic. But she had popliteal disease. And look at the left great toe waveform. on the, So these are toe PPGs. And you can see the right great toe pressure is 70. The left is zero. So that means she's getting very little flow to the great toe. So then I was kind of surprised. So of course we took her to angiography. I've shown you this case. And a great access in this case because everything proximal is normal. You can go up and over as well. I put a six French sheath in, which is my standard. You can put in a different size if you want. I like a six French sheath because I can put in two catheter and guide wire systems. You can put in two 014 systems if you're tackling two, two tibial vessels and so forth. I like a six French sheath because when I'm putting in various stents and devices, I can inject around those devices for positioning and so forth. And when you think about it, when you're, if you're going to close the groin with some type of closure device, you really need a six French sheath. So rather than having to upsize all the time, I put in a standard six French sheath for all those reasons. And, and I typically use suture mediated. Other people use other devices. Um, and, you know, that's another whole discussion. So you can see here again, a relatively it doesn't look remarkably abnormal. And I've shown you this case, right? So we ivised it and now you can see there's clearly there's a disease in that, in that uh, SFA. And then if you look, that's an IVIS catheter, which is 018. And the vessel in three dimensions is flat. So that's why the angiogram looks relatively normal. Plus my relative, I say relatively, right? It's clearly abnormal if you look at this. And I think if you look at that, there's clearly abnormal. But the IVIS really tells the whole story. It's really not you know, very big. It's a very small vessel that's diseased because of circumferential atherosclerotic plaque in this diabetic. So we did vessel prep. In this case, we did orbital atherectomy to shave off the plaque. We did prolonged uh, angioplasty and drug-coated balloon therapy, uh, five millimeters based on IVIS measurement, not angiographic arterial measurement, but IVIS. So we properly sized the vessel. And you can see there's a big difference in the angiographic appearance of this artery. And then if you look again, I've shown you this case on the left, that's the difference in flow. So this subtle difference made a huge change in her perfusion to her foot and to her toe. And so the podiatrist went on and, and resected all that dead tissue, good care. She got hyperbaric therapy or hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And then she is now almost, uh, she's healed basically. Right? Okay, so classic CLI patient, right? All the hallmarks of chronic ischemia, right? Shiny skin, hairless skin, uh, thickened nails, um, large wound down to really the tendon, you can see there. And, uh, and it's a little bit swollen, not because of venous disease, just because the, the patient has such profound rest pain that they keep their foot in a dependent position all day and night because it just hurts when they don't. And so as a result, they're not giving their body a chance to drain. Pulse volume recordings. You can see here that the ABI is 0.2. So we know there's severe peripheral arterial disease on the right side. You can look at the waveforms. 
the thigh, the calf, the ankle, the metatarsals are all markedly dampened on the right side. You can see the segmental pressures are completely abnormal and they're not able to obtain some of them because of how heavy, heavy calcification. So we know we have, you know, we're either dealing with multi-level disease um, in this patient. I did a TCOM, we'll skip that for now. Uh, right common femoral artery waveform, you can see a nice triphasic waveform, it's normal. The proximal SFA below it, you can see again, is triphasic and normal on both. B mode imaging, you gotta look to see, is there plaque, is it soft plaque? You know, people will, a lot of times will see soft atherosclerotic plaque in an aorta or on a vessel and they'll say, oh, there's thrombus. It's not thrombus, it is soft atherosclerotic plaque. It can be thrombus on ultrasound. On CT, you don't know if it's a combination of a soft atherosclerotic plaque and thrombus, but when you ultrasound, you should be able to tell acute thrombus, right? Acute thrombus is, is uh, um, anechoic. You can't really see it well. Um, it tends to be darker in appearance, less echogenic. As it becomes a little bit echogenic and so forth, now you're dealing with soft atherosclerotic plaque. You start getting shadowing, you're dealing with calcification. So in this case, we did anti-grade access. He did have SFA pop disease. So if you look at this PVR, look at the, high th the right thigh to right calf. There's lack of augmentation. There's a delayed systolic upstroke. There's rounding of the peak. There's loss of the dichrotic notch. So you know there's fem pop disease. And then the right ankle waveform is so dampened. And based on the segmental pressures from 67 to 32, remember a difference of 20, significant reduction there. We know there's also tibioperinal artery disease, right? So he's got both. And so we did anagrade. <clears throat> we treated that SFA pop. Then we went to his tibial disease. Uh, we used a bunch of maneuvers, which we've gone through before. Okay, we had orbital atherectomy in this case. And then we were able to revascularize this guy. Luckily, he had a lot of hibernating vessels. So vessels that are open, but not seen initially on angiography until the uh, highway to them is opened up. He had a night, uh, so he had a lot of hibernating vessels in his foot, which was good for us because it gave us a nice wound blush. So I think all of you can look at that. It, you know, it looks like a tumor blush in a liver or a kidney or elsewhere, but in a, with a wound, that's a nice angiographic wound blush. You can see the hyperemia around the edges of the wound, very little centrally, but that's where the healing is going to start. But you can see again, the difference. Again, we didn't get a perfect result because he also has disease elsewhere, but we increased the ABI from 0.2 to 0.7. And you can see now the right calf and right ankle waveform significantly improved. So you know that physiologically you made a difference uh, and he got healing. And I, I still didn't upload that other picture where it's completely healed.